If God is all powerful and all loving, why does he allow horrible things to happen to such good people? Well, that seems to be the question of the ages, doesn't it? It's the question that many of us have asked at different times in our life. I remember, I remember really the first time I asked the question, uh, you know, because I, I, can, I can say this with reservation that, <clears throat> I, you know, I've, I've had a good life. I've lived a very good life and, and not suffered a lot of tragedy or, um, you know, things that, that some of you have gone through. And, and I, I don't say that uh, braggadociously or, uh, you know, I say it with great humility because I know that, uh, that just around the corner something could be lurking. And you understand what I'm talking about. So just, we just count our blessings every day. But I remember in 1989, I was in seminary. We had been married, Jennifer and I, for about three months <clears throat> and was driving to Johnson City, Tennessee to go to Emmanuel. You might remember uh, Dan Lawson was here a few weeks ago. And they have class on a two-day schedule, and I was on the Tuesday-Wednesday schedule that semester. And I remember uh, after the Tuesday classes, I went to... I went to the, uh, you know, to the house, the guest house where I was staying, and you might remember something happened in September. About this time of the year, uh, a hurricane uh, came through, and uh, it, it swept up through really Savannah, and, or not Savannah so much, but Charleston and that area, Hurricane Hugo. You remember that? I don't know that it affected this area so much, but, and it really didn't affect Mercer County a whole lot, but there were some some uh, big, I can remember some big giant trees in my grandparents' yard that were uprooted and it caused some devastation. It caused a lot more down south, but it was that, it was that very day when Hurricane Hugo hit and I was in seminary. I was down in Johnson City and I got the phone call and my mother was on the line. I remember thinking, oh my goodness, something has happened to somebody with the hurricane, but she, she told me about my first cousin, Wayne. <clears throat> Wayne was, uh, he was kind of the, one of the oldest grandchildren in, in our family on my mother's side. Had two little boys, uh, Jonathan and Jason, just little bitty guys at the time, and, and they were just, uh, you know, just a great family. Wayne and Barbara, just, you know, uh, my first cousin. We, he was older than I was, of course, but uh, we had a good relationship, you know. We were a tight family, and I remember my mother, uh, with her voice cracking, say, Wayne was killed, and I thought it had something to do with the hurricane, but... His son's birthday was, the, was that day, and he was driving home late at night after uh, working maybe 24 hours or so, and uh, he, I think, we, we think he fell asleep and uh, swerved off the road and hit uh, some kind of a tree or a, a pole, and they found his body in front, of the car, in front of the car, and they knew that he had crawled out and was trying to get to the road, but his neck was broken, and that's where they found him dead. And that was one thing, you know, to hear that news and to not know really how to register that in my mind and in my, my life. But, uh, you know, he was still a cousin. It wasn't like my immediate family. So for that I was grateful, but still it affected our larger family. But at the time I was uh, the preacher at, uh, at, at the little church where I started my ministry at Goodwin's Chapel. <clears throat> and my aunt, the and, and Wayne went to that church, and I can remember uh, uh, that very Sunday, the Sunday before, I had called on Wayne to have our closing prayer. And so it, it hit me that I was going to have to stand in front of my aunt, which I did uh, just uh, a day or so later, and hear that question that I did not at that time in my life, uh, even today, I didn't have a good answer for. She asked me that question, why? Why? Why would God take my son, who has two little boys? Why? What good reason is there? And, uh, you know, that's been the question for a lot of you. You've asked that same question in different kind of scenarios, different uh, situations. And, and I suspect that as life goes on, many of you will still ask that question. Why? Why, God? And really the bigger question is, why do you allow suffering in the first place? You know, St. Teresa of Avila said this. She said, Lord, if this is the way you treat your friends, 
I'd hate to see how you treat your enemies. And I know why you don't have many friends. Skeptics will say, well, you know, God, God, if, you know, since there's evil in the world, and God is supposed to be good, then why doesn't God do something about evil? Either he lacks the will, or he lacks the power. If God lacks the will to do something about suffering, then he's not good. If God lacks the power to do something about suffering, then he's not God. And so that's kind of the question, isn't it? Uh, you know, why God? Why do you allow suffering? Either uh, God is all-powerful or he isn't, or he doesn't care. And that's the question we have. So why is there suffering? This is a series, again, that's going to be about six, seven weeks. And we're really going to go through the life of Joseph. But today, this is kind of an introductory message that I wanted to talk about suffering. Why is there suffering in the world today? Why does God allow suffering? Uh, pain. And let me just say to you that you, many of you may uh, ha have lived a life like I lived for so many years of my life, and you didn't really have any suffering. You didn't really have any tragedy or pain or bad things really happen to you, and there weren't really a whole lot of people around you that did. So if that's the case, then God bless you. That, that's rare, isn't it? It's rare. And here's what most of us know, that the longer you live, the older you get, the more likely something is going to happen that's going to absolutely have the capacity to shake your faith, to rock your world. So um, when these things happen, I, I, I want to make, here's what I want to make sure of, that your faith isn't shaken. Because I know of people right here in this church over my 18 years of ministry here whose faith was shaken because of tragedy in their life and who today may or may not, I don't know, because they're not here anymore have a strong faith. They may or may not. So why, why do we suffer? Let's look at this question. Is it punishment for sin? It, it, are we being punished for our sin? When Job, when Job was suffering in the Old Testament, his friends all came around him. You remember this? And remember, uh, you know, uh, all the things they said. And, and by the way, if, if, if we had friends like Job's friends, we wouldn't need enemies, would we? Because they came strolling in when Job's tragedy struck. And they kept saying to Job, Job, uh, you've done something wrong. You've sinned. You've messed up somewhere, and that's why God is punishing you. He's punishing you. Punishment for sin. Well, we know partly that might be part of the answer. You, you remember, Moses wasn't allowed to go into the, will, into the promised land because in the wilderness, he, uh, he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. He disobeyed God. He showed his anger there. Miriam, his sister, remember she tried to usurp his authority and uh, she got the leprous hand. She was punished for sin. You might remember Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. They lied to God. Remember that? When they lied to, to Peter and the apostles about the property they sold and how much money they got. And, uh, and they both dropped dead. And that went across the church as kind of a warning that you don't, you don't lie to the Holy Spirit. You don't lie to God. God will, he'll kill you. You know, that was kind of the, the, uh, the idea. Herod, you might remember Herod, he, uh, he kind of took some of God's glory. If you remember in the book of Acts, and the Bible says that, that God allowed him uh, to die in his body to be eaten by worms. And we can go through the Bible and see that this is a valid reason for some suffering, for some people, that they're being punished for sin. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, the writer says, Don't make light of the Lord's discipline. and Don't lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So we know it, it could be that when you suffer, it's punishment. That's a dangerous road to take when you're talking to somebody else, like Job's friends, but it could be true. You could be being punished. Well, there's another reason. <clears throat> Maybe it's the result of dumb behavior. You know, if you go out here and you, and you fool around on your spouse, and you contract some kind of a disease, then that, that's not, you know, that's just a result of a dumb choice, isn't it? It's dumb behavior. When you make a, a dumb choice like that, uh, you know, if you, 
If you go out here and you get drunk and you get into an automobile and you, and you wreck and, uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, you lose the use of your legs or you're injured severely, then, then you can't blame God for that. That was your choice. You made that dumb choice. Bad habits, promiscuity, foolish pride, all these things, you know. We overestimate ourselves and, uh, and we do things and make these dumb decisions and we suffer as a result of it. If we say, oh, I don't have to study for that test, I'm smart enough. Anybody ever done that? I'm smart enough, I got this covered. And you get up there the next day and it's like, oh, she asked all the questions I wasn't ready for and you fail the test. Well, you can't blame God or your parents for that. It's because you, you made a dumb choice. You decided not to study. How about a satanic attack? Well, I mentioned Job just a while ago. We know, if we know the Bible, that God allowed Satan to attack uh, Job's life. Satan came with the sons of God and said, what, and God said, what about Job? And, and uh, Satan said, yeah, but it's because you have a hedge of protection around him. Let me get at him. And God said, okay, get at him, but don't touch his life. And, uh, and all these things started happening in his life. And then uh, he came back and he said, yeah, but, uh, you know, he's not cursing you because you won't let me touch his life. And God said, okay, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. And, uh, and so that's when Job got these boils and he got, he's suffering with with this disease, but and his, even his wife said, curse God and die, but this was a satanic attack. And we certainly understand and know that Satan uh, attacks us. You know that song we just sang, it is well with my soul. Do you remember that line? Though Satan should buffet. In other words, so he should, should pour it on to us. I'm not going to, I'm not going to forsake my God. Uh, Paul had a thorn in the flesh that he believed was a satanic attack. And God used that thorn in his flesh. I think it was his eyesight, by the way. God used that thorn in his flesh for, uh, to humble him and to get him to where he wanted him to be. You know, it's the devil that uh, Jesus was talking about who says the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. Well, <clears throat> a satanic attack, or what about the sins of others? You know, I mentioned the drunk driver. What if, what if that drunk driver gets in his automobile and he's driving and your son teenage son or daughter is driving down the road and the drunk driver comes into the path of your son or daughter or yourself and you're the one who loses the use of your legs or suffers severely. There's a lot of times when you and I suffer because other people are dumb, right? Remember being in class and somebody made a dumb decision and the teacher said, look, and I'll tell somebody confesses, everybody's going to suffer. You remember that? How many of you had that happen to you? How many of you, it was you the one who were the guilty one? <laughs> Thanks for being honest, Gordon. So everybody's like, somebody's going to squeal on you. You know, that happens to us. We have in Thomas Hospital, where my daughter works with Linda Thomas, five out of ten babies are born being addicted to drugs. That baby's going to suffer. And whoever takes that baby, if they are allowed to, you know, are going to suffer because of the consequences of somebody else's dumb choices. So uh, that's a legitimate reason. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, God says that the sins of the father are visited on the children to the third and the fourth generation. The genetic, genetics of disease like alcohol and drugs may be a real thing and if your if your if your mom or dad had a temper and they flew off a handle and you inherited that temper and you're saying I'm just like my dad and you're suffering the same consequences that he suffered or she suffered you know the bible says that a lot of times we grow up in this environment where we learn these things and we're we're now suffering the results of sin because our grandparents are our parents so that's a legitimate uh, reason for suffering what about persecution? Persecution, you could suffer. There are people today in other parts of the world, and maybe even here in this country, who are being persecuted because of being a Christian. And they're suffering. I mean, uh, you know, I, I have, I, I think I told you about my friend in Iraq, this female uh, who was one of our translators, and uh, she emailed me not too long ago and said, you've got to help me get out. <clears throat> and I answered her back and said, tell me what to do. 
She wants me to write some kind of a letter, and I said, tell me who to write the letter to. And I don't know, you know, and she's, uh, she's Muslim, but she's suffering, but she was telling me about the Christians, and she's uh, one of these, what we would call moderate, but she's telling me about the Christians, friends of hers who are suffering. And you know, the Bible already predicted that. Paul said, if every, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you see that right there? It doesn't say they may be. You might be persecuted. It says you will be persecuted. How come we don't share that at response time? When people are trying to make a decision whether or not to accept Christ and, and to give their life to him and be a follower of Christ, become a Christian. Hey, before you make that decision, I want to tell you something. You're going to be persecuted. In fact, it may cost you a lot. And people throughout the ages have been, haven't they? They've been persecuted severely, and it's going on right now in our world. So, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons. There's lots of reasons why we suffer. <clears throat> but, you know, I think one of the biggest reasons is because we live in a fallen world. I remember when, uh, when my wife was, uh, I, I don't remember now which child it was, if it was Jordan, our oldest, or Taylor, our middle, or Courtney, our youngest, uh, at the birthing center up here where we went drug free. I think that should get a, a great job. You drug free, Crystal. Uh, can you do that? You know, <laughs> and, you know all we had was a, a flat diet Pepsi and we went drug free with, uh, with Courtney. But I can remember my wife, I think, I don't know, maybe it was all three of them. She kind of looked up at me, and I thought she was going to say something, be mad at me, and she said, I'm going to get Eve when I see her. <laughs> well, we do. We live in a fallen world where now the result of living in a fallen world is pain, natural disasters, natural disasters that will wipe out entire communities. You know, we're blessed, I think, to live in this state and not in the breadbasket of the nation where it's flat. It's like a, a tornado alley where people can wake up one morning to a complete devastation of their entire community. Those things happen because we live in a fallen world. You know, and we live in a fallen world because God has given us freedom of choice. He's given us free will. And so we, we make dumb decisions and we suffer. And so Adam and Eve made a dumb decision. He gave them the freedom to choose, right or wrong. And they chose wrong. And now we have this Pandora's box of suffering and things coming out that we have to live with, you and I. It was St. Augustine who first tried to talk about the reasons for suffering. St. Augustine lived in the 5th century and he was uh, you know, one of the great early church fathers, and, and he was trying to explain suffering. And you know, suffering has baffled, it has baffled theologians, not only the common people, you know, why does God allow this, but it's baffled theologians for centuries. And so Augustine believed that there, there was no such thing as evil as a created entity. In other words, God didn't create good and evil because God is all good. And God can't create evil. And Satan, although Satan was a created being, he has power to attack, but he also can't create evil. He can't create anything. Only God can create. However, here's what Satan does, according to St. Augustine. He takes what is good, what God has made for good, and he twists it, and he perverts it, and he... He, he, he disguises it and he makes it bad. For instance, lust is a twisted, perverted form of healthy desire. And we could just go down the list of things that, and so that's kind of uh, uh, something for you to think about if you're in college and you're, and you're talking to professors who have this idea about good and evil. Some would say there's no such thing as evil. It's good that's been twisted. So we could say evil is is good that's been perverted by Satan and by people like you and me who have freedom of choice, who take what's good and we make it bad. And we could really talk about a lot of things here. I like what <clears throat> Romans 8 and Paul said here as far as a fallen world goes. He said, look, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the very present time. In other words, our earth is groaning. It is, it is 
It is just groaning in pain because of the choices of people. And, you know, environmentalists would take that and run with it and say, yeah, look at, look at uh, you know, look at the, what's going on, uh, you know, a mountaintop removal. Or, you know, they, they would say, look at how we're destroying the planet and, and uh, look at how we're destroying the ozone layer and the environment. You know, God gave us creation to, uh, to enjoy and to use. He didn't give it to us so that it would be equal to us, so that we would have to respect it in a way that we can't do what we want to do with it. He gave it to man to use. However, we need to use it responsibly, don't we? Knowing that uh, future generations would like to use it the way we use it. So we need to be responsible. However, remember that God doesn't put his spirit in a tree or a whale or a turtle or an owl or some kind of an endangered bug somewhere. God puts his spirit in humanity, doesn't he? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, one of these people who, like, oh, you you got to save the whale. Save the whale if you can, but save the man, if you will. I don't think there will be whales in heaven. I don't know. I don't have any indication, but I know there will be people there. And I want you to be there, and you want me to be there, I hope. So we ask, why suffering? Even if we could identify the source of suffering, if we could say, yeah, this was a result of my dumb choice or a result of uh, this result of somebody else's sin or a satanic attack or persecution, even if we could identify it and pinpoint it, we still would be left with the question, God, why? Why do you even allow it? Take that away from us. But do you know what you're asking when you, when you ask that question? What you would be asking is, God, take my freedom of choice away. God, make me a puppet. Don't let me choose wrong. It would be one thing, you know, I've often thought, you know, God, why don't you just make everybody do the right thing? Well, what would that be like? Uh, we'd be like robots, you know. We'd, it would, what, would, what would life be like, uh, uh, you know, if we did that? I don't know, maybe it would be great. Maybe that would be heaven. You know, here's a question I have. If, if we still will have freedom of choice in heaven, will we have the capacity to sin in heaven and be like Lucifer, kicked out of heaven? If I don't know. I hope not. Will God take our freedom of choice away in heaven? That's a question I can't answer. But I do believe that when we know as we've been known, when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that we will know as we've been known, uh, I think, and when we live in the presence of the Savior, I mean, the, his very presence, it's not some kind of a figment of our imagination or something that we worship that we can't see. You know, oftentimes when I, when I come into the worship service and I see us standing around so humdrum and, and so hum-ho and it's like, you know, uh, hurry up and get through this song or whatever, I wonder what it would really be like if Jesus showed up here today. What would we be doing? How would we respond? Would we just kind of say, oh, worship my Savior? I don't think so. I think those of you who are what you might call more reserved worshipers, if at all, I think, I think you're, you're, gonna be, you're going to be knocked flat on your face, as will I. As was John in the book of Revelation when he came into the presence with just the angel. And the angel said, get up, I'm not Jesus. Don't worship me. But I think in heaven we'll, we'll have that. I, I just think that it will be, we'll have such a greater uh, 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 sensory of his presence with us that it'll be, it'll be hard for you to sin. But it, this has baffled theologians. God, even if we know, why don't you protect us? You know, sometimes he does, doesn't he? The old timers used to pray a hedge of protection around us. Did anybody ever have a hedge of protection prayed around you? A hedge of protection. And you know, I always used to think about being surrounded by bushes or something. I don't know why. That's not a bad thing, you know. They say when, you're, when your daughter, you know, when she turns uh, uh, 12, you should put her in a barrel and then and with a hole in it to feed her, and then when she turns 15 or 16, you should, you should cover the hole up, you know, and uh, wait till she's 18 or 21 to come out. Now, we're not going to do that. But, uh, you know, uh, we pray a, a hedge of protection around our children, don't we? 
And sometimes God protects and sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes God will protect your child and not somebody else's child. And how do you explain that? What do you say when, when your child walks away unharmed, unscathed, but, but your neighbor's child was killed or your friend's child was killed? What do you say then? How do you say, my child was better than yours? I prayed a hedge of protection and you didn't? It's tough, isn't it? That's a tough place to be. And sometimes we shouldn't say anything at all. Sometimes we should just be there. Matt Proctor, the president of uh, the North American Christian Convention a couple years ago in Ozark Bible College in Missouri, was talking about the tornado that came through, uh, you know, that area. Uh, was it was 2011, I believe. And he and his wife were coming back with some students they had some students in two vans and they were driving right when this the tornado was coming through. And they didn't know, they just knew this bad storm and there were tornado warnings. And he said they could barely see. He was behind his wife and his wife tells this story about how she couldn't even see. And finally, a big tree fell in the road and she slammed on her brakes and luckily he didn't ram into the back of her and they both slammed on their brakes and they got out and they went to this house nearby and they told him, hey, you know, we, we are, we're right here and uh, the storm's coming. Can we take refuge here? And they went down to the basement and they found out later that had the tree not fallen and they had driven a, 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 another minute forward, that that was exactly in the path of this huge tornado that destroyed uh, much of that area. So would we say that God, can you tell stories like that? Any of you have stories where you know, had you been there, you would have been in that accident. But for some reason you were delayed or some reason your wife said one more minute and you guys didn't get out the door like you wanted to and, God, and now you look back and say, God saved me. He saved my life. We can tell stories like that, but what about the times when that doesn't happen? And we've had people right here in our own church who've lost their lives car accidents and diseases and all sorts of ways. So, sometimes bad things happen to good people. We know why, sometimes we don't know why, and we, we ask the questions. But I don't know, I, you know, I wish I was smart enough that God would say, Dave, I'm going to just give you the answer in just a few sentences. I'm going to give you this answer. I wish God would do that. And as much as I know all the apologetic arguments, all the big arguments for why there's suffering and pain in the world, it still doesn't satisfy me when something bad happens in my life. God, if you love me, how could you let this happen? And that's the question you're going to have to wrestle and grapple with, just like I do. And many of you are wrestling with that right now. And many of you have never wrestled with that, but you will. Why, why did I get cancer? Why did my husband get cancer? Why did, why did my cousin die? Why did... Why? I think this picture describes it as good as any I know of. Maybe you've had this experience. I have, and many of you fathers and mothers have. <clears throat> and uh, when you take those training wheels off for the first time, I mean, for the very first time, you inevitably know something's going to happen, don't you? I mean, maybe, maybe you, you held them on a long time, but you know at some point in the, the next few days, perhaps, there's going to be a moment when, when the training wheels are off, that child is going to come into a situation and that bike is going to crash over and there's going to be some crying and some pain and some scrapes and burns and who knows, maybe some head bumps, all sorts of things are going to happen. It's like giving the keys of a car to your 16-year-old who just got her license. You're like, oh. And you know there's going to be fenders dented and Stuff happening, you just pray God put a hedge of protection around them and just, it just please, uh, you know, if it, it may, may it only be a scrape or a fender or something. And why is it, I want to know, when you're riding with your 16 year old, that uh, 25 or 35 miles an hour feels like 55 miles an hour? Why is that? Just trying to figure that one out. Well, <clears throat> 
I think that's what it's like. Our Heavenly Father is the same way. He's not going to protect us from all pain and suffering. We are to live as lights in this world, and sometimes the very way that you respond to pain and suffering in your life might be the thing that a lost person or somebody that doesn't know Jesus, it might be what it takes for them to say, how did you do that? How did you go through that? And you still have a smile on your face a week later. How can you be so calm and at such peace? How can you sing, it is well with my soul? When God just allowed or took from you what you love the most. It's tough, isn't it? Tough question. Well, there are three promises he makes. Real quickly, he, he'll always be at our side. He'll always be at our side, won't he? He doesn't promise that he'll prevent it, but he will promise that he'll be there for us. I love this psalm that is probably one of the most familiar and famous psalms ever Right smack dab in the middle of it, David, the king says, even though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. That's a promise you can take to the bank. I like the bumper sticker that says, Lord, help me to remember today that nothing's going to happen that you and I can't handle together, and mostly you. And there's a second promise that he'll bless us and deepen our faith if we'll let him. Now I've seen people have suffering and tragedy in their life and they turn away, run from the church, they go exactly, they do the opposite thing. They get some disease or something happens in their life and instead of, instead of having the people around them that love them, that want to pray for them, that want to stand in the gap for them, that want to be there for them, they isolate themselves in their home or they they get angry at God, and it's okay to be angry at God. That's a process that you're going through. But I, I've seen it to where it's anger that turns into bitterness, that turns into walking away from God. And I know it's hard when, when something happens in your life to come back to church and say, I, I'm here. And everybody knows what happened to me. Everybody, you know about the funeral, you were there, you know the tragedy. But I'm here. I'm here because this is where I need to, as hard as it is, this is where I need to be to continue to hear from God. And that's why I'm so proud of so many of you who have gone through this, but, but you, you're here. So uh, if you'll let it, it'll grow your faith. My sister, after 27 years, her husband walked off with some younger chick, and that's putting it nicely, 27 years. You think your marriage is pretty safe. And he's a closet alcoholic, I think, for the most part, and I, I guess he was just tired of not being able to live the way he wanted to live. And our family, I mean, we're pretty open with our faith, and I guess over oh, 27 years, it just kind of, he got, he got tired of hiding it. And so he just walked off, walked away from his wife, my sister, and uh, his three beautiful daughters, and now a granddaughter, and maybe a little contact, but for the most part, he's gone. And I think if you would talk to my sister, maybe today, I know I'm pretty sure a year from now, and this has happened over the last three years, I think she would say, you know, that was the hardest time in my life. But I'm a stronger Christian now because of it. I'm stronger in my faith and deeper now because of it. Maybe that's your situation. And it's, it's tough to be there. It's tough to suffer. But if you remember that the, the suffering, these trials, the book of James says, will make you stronger. I know it's hard for you to even care about that now, but they will. And that's a promise from God. He promises that they will. And the last promise he makes, or maybe not the last one, but the last one I'm going to talk about, is that he's going to make it all right one day. Isn't that our hope? Isn't that our hope that he will make it right one day? And this is not the end. 
This life is only a vapor, James says. It's a vapor, it's poof. And it might feel like, gosh, I've been around forever. My grandmother used to say, if I don't die soon, all my friends are going to think I didn't make it. <laughs> and it might feel like, oh man, this life is so long. But I want to tell you, when you get into eternity, you'll look back and say, my life, man, it was like blip. It's like a blip on the screen of eternity. That's hard for us to imagine, isn't it? Because we have memories and life and stuff going on. But that's what the Bible says. This life is only the, like the, this is the, this is like the, the interview phase of your career. You're being interviewed right now for eternity. That's what it is. You are in the interview of your life. And you're standing in front of the interviewer, Almighty God, and he is saying, what are you made of? What stuff do you have? What kind of situation can you go through? And you're being interviewed. That's what your life is. The psalmist said, three score. If by strength, four score. And in King James, that's a score is 20 years, maybe 80 years. My dad, we just celebrated his 75th birthday. And he told us about his grandfather, my great-grandfather, who lived to be 84 before he was burned up in a, in a house fire because my dad's dad, they think, fell asleep drunk with a cigarette in his hand and it burned, fell into the, the magazine rack and burned the house down. They found my great-grandfather's body at the back door trying to get out, but they found my grandfather's seat pants still attached to the seat. He never moved. No heart problems, most likely a, a drunken stupor. And my dad said if he hadn't have done that, maybe he would have been 85 or 90. Maybe my great-grandfather would have lived to be 90. And my dad's 75, and that's, that's good news for me, perhaps. The stress doesn't kill me. But I want to tell you, I, regardless, I have the promise that one day, everything will make sense. Everything. You know, when you were in school, and uh, sometimes kids today, when they're in school, and they're doing their homework, and they'll do these problems, they, someone tells them, or maybe the teacher just f confesses and says, hey, look, you know, all the answers are in the back of the book. And you're like, really? And so, you know, you... You can't get this problem, so you turn to the back of the book, and you're like, ooh, okay, that's, that makes sense now. And you go back, and you, that's the way it's going to be. It's like looking at the back of the book, getting all the answers. And it's hard now to work out the problem. But that's, that's, that's what he says. I'm going to make it all right. He says he'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Look, remember, remember, heaven is not just wishful thinking. It is a real thing. Remember these two words real quickly. Time. The Bible says a thousand days are like a, uh, a thousand years are like a day in God's sight. And one, one day is like a thousand years. Just remember that. That's eternity. And remember the word trust. Trust. I like what Job said. He says, though he slay me, I will trust him. I like these verses. I, I've asked my daughter to come and sing a song. I think it was Corey Ten Boom that said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. I've asked her just to come and sing this song over you. You may need this today. 